Moliere's play Tartuffe is really often talked about as a play that's about religious hypocrisy. But I'm not really sure that's what it's about at all. I think it's maybe more about the issue of true loyalty versus technical or seeming loyalty. So first of all, let's talk about the idea of religious hypocrisy. Well, Tartuffe definitely is a religious hypocrite. We're told uh, by Argonne that when he first uh, saw him, he was the church and uh, how pious he was. And we're told over and over again how pious he is. But then Parnell also talks about how pious he is. And yet, when we see him, though some of what he's doing has to do with justifying his behavior religiously, more commonly, he's using uh, reason or maybe strained reason to release himself from any kind of religious obligations. In fact, we don't see him at all for the first two acts. The first two acts don't play, take place in any kind of religious setting. They take place in the home. And I think in the first two acts is where we really see the real theme occurring, and that has to do with loyalty. In that case, it's loyalty to family, though the family story is part of a kind of bigger question. Now, sometimes what I'll tell students about comedies is that when you're looking at great literature, the more comic something is, usually the more difficult the philosophical question it's dealing with. In this case, I would argue that the difficult philosophical question that it's dealing with isn't one of, should you be a religious hypocrite? Because there's a very facile and easy answer to that. No, don't be a religious hypocrite. Nor even do I think it's Cleant's, uh, you know, Cleant corrects Orgone by the end of the play, where Orgone starts by saying, oh, uh, Tartuffe is so holy, to I hate all holy men. And Cleant first says, look, you are slandering all holy men when you say that, that Tartuffe is one, when he clearly is not. But on the other side, then he's the one who corrects him the other way and says, well, you know, just because th this guy wasn't doesn't mean other people aren't holy. And although I think the play does, does keep itself open to the idea that some holiness is legitimate and some is illegitimate, most of the play doesn't really have to do with that. There's talk about that, but really it has to do with family loyalty and who's loyal to whom. So, Throughout the play, I think we can see we have two main kinds of characters. We have characters who are loyal to their family members on by obeying what they have to say or obeying what they do, but are in some other way disloyal in what they're doing. And then we have other characters who are disloyal. They break the rules in some way out of an overriding loyalty for the family. Right? So. I think a wonderful, uh, a wonderful example of this is Doreen. Doreen, in no way, uh, in terms of her surface responsibilities, fulfills the res fulfills what she's supposed to be doing. She, you know, rebels and in schemes and won't hold her tongue and all sorts of things. But she does these things ultimately out of a kind of loyalty that she has. Uh, loyalty that she has for Marianne, and I think to a lesser extent uh, to Argonne, to a lesser but real extent. Another example, I think, is of the conflict between Marianne and Valère. 
In Marion and Valer, we see an issue which arises in this whole thing about loyalty, which is what is said versus what is unsaid. And in the case of Marianne, Marianne is someone who never says. In some ways, she is the opposite of Doreen, where Doreen never keeps her mouth shut. Marianne typically will not speak to the degree that Orgone has to say to her, say these words for me, uh, until she uh, kind of refuses, sort of. Um, she, do, she doesn't say them, but uh, she, it's hard for her to directly refuse him uh, in, in that way. And so we end up with a conflict between Marianne and, and Valer, where each one feels betrayed like the other one does not love them. But the reason is because of what is not said rather than what is said. Their lack of speech seems disloyal, to, loyal, while in their hearts they are ultimately loyal to one another. And I think this question of loyalty we see until finally, in the end, this messenger, uh, uh, the bailiff that comes, his name is, of course, Loyal. And he comes and he's acting in what appears to be, what is technically, in fact, a loyal, uh, you know, a, a, a loyal position to the crown. But he's doing something that he knows maybe is unjust, but... He is being technically loyal while in some way being loyal to what is right. Whereas Tartuffe, knowing full well what he's doing, takes the box to the king and says, uh, in an act of loyalty, but an act of loyalty to the king that's really about only loyalty to himself and disloyalty to Orgone. And as we go through this, we see that the loyalties throughout are tested in the family and that we have Elmir and Orgone's loyalty to one another, both Elmir's loyalty to stay uh, faithful to Orgone, but also Orgone's loyalty to have some sort of faith in his wife uh, is tested as well. Uh, you know, we see that there are this set of interlocking um, marriages uh, that, uh, you know, between uh, of course, Marianne and and uh, and Valer, uh, but also Demi, uh, and this sense that if the if Orgone's loyalty remains misplaced, all of their loyalties will fall apart. And indeed, when Doreen is told that Marianne may be forced to marry Tartuffe, what she says, is, what her argument is, if you do this. He will be cuckolded. In other words, if you do this in some way, Marianne will be forced to do something disloyal in cheating on her husband. But she doesn't seem to place the blame on this imaginary, uh, you know, future sin on Marianne, but rather on Argonne for creating this situation. And so... I think in the end, when finally, in the last moments, when it turns out that the king has already determined right from wrong, and we have this description of the king who sees what is true and what is untrue, who knows who is loyal and who is disloyal, we see more of a description of God than of the king, and a sense that God knows what is true true and what is untrue. And so because of this, I think, Tartuffe, with all of its wackiness and hiding under tables and, uh, uh, you know, uh, silliness, I think it's really getting at an interesting question, which is, when is it the just and loyal thing to break the rules? When is it okay and maybe even good to lie to someone because you're loyal to them versus when is it wrong to do the thing which, according to the rules, is the right thing? It follows the religious uh, rules uh, or uh, it seems to uh, support the king when, in point of fact, you're doing it for disloyalty or to be disloyal. In other words, when is what appears to be the right thing the wrong thing? And when is what appears to be the wrong thing the right thing? 
Now, most of the time, we don't have to deal with this. Most of the time, the thing that appears to be the wrong thing is the wrong thing. And the thing that appears to be the right thing is the right thing. And most of the time, when we see a disconnect between those two, there isn't a real disconnect. We're just simply trying to rationalize our own behavior. But the Play Tartuffe notes that there are times when the opposite is true, when it is a real struggle, and it raises those questions and invites the viewer, or in this case, the reader, to ask those questions about this funny situation in Tartuffe, perhaps about the situation in your own life.